Today I'm joined by Jin Ling Chen, who is the Director General of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Toronto. She has decades of diplomatic experience all over the world, including Vietnam, Malaysia, the US, and Canada. On this episode, I was pleased to speak with her about Taiwan's political switch from dictatorship to democracy, Taiwan's relationship with Canada, and what Jin Ling's hopes are for the future of Taiwan on the international, international stage. Here's my conversation with Jin Ling Chen. My name is John McKay, and I am the Member of Parliament for Scarborough Guildwood. And uh, this is our latest uh, recording on uh, we make a living by what we uh, get, and we make a life by what we give. And over the last few years, we've had a number of interesting interviews with various people, some of whom uh, have higher profiles than others, such as my guest today, um, and others who uh, work in the riding in obscure circumstances <laughs> and yet make dramatic uh, impact on, um, on the lives of our constituents in Scarborough Guildwood. My guest today is Ms. Uh, Jin <clears throat> Ling Chen who is the Director General of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office here in Toronto. Um, and I've got to know uh, Jin, uh, Jin Ling over the years as the latest Director General, in part because <coughs> Taiwan's affairs are so central to Canada's, but also because there is a uh, Taipei Cultural Center on Progress Avenue just off Markham Road, where a number of... Um, cultural and or political events are held on a regular basis, and I'm honored to, to be um, to be present. So um, welcome to uh, the program, uh, Ms. Chen. Um, we're, uh, we're, uh, look, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Well, good morning, Chang MP. Thank you for having me. Um, my pleasure um, to have a conversation with you online. And frankly speaking, this is my first experience on podcast. Yeah, but uh, yeah, appreciate this opportunity. Well, we'll try not to make it a bad experience for you, but uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, we will um, have some interesting <laughs> conversations because. Uh, but I, 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 what I like to talk yeah. about uh, right off the top <laughs> is who you are. Um, so I'm going to assume, and you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that you were born in Taiwan. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I was born in Taiwan, grew up in Taiwan, and uh, I grew up in the family. My family is uh, doing business uh, since I was a, a child. Um, then I educated in Taiwan all the time until graduate. Uh, my major in the university is diplomacy, that is uh, international relations. Uh, in the graduate, I study at European studies. And that's just the beginning of the European Union. So th then till now, many years later, uh, EU have expanded its membership very, very fast and widely. Mm -hmm. And I joined the Foreign Service of Taiwan in 1997. 1997, um, that's a few years ago, not 27 years ago. Oh, you yeah, it's not long ago. You were 10 years old. Appreciate that. Thank you, John. Yeah. <laughs> You're very kind. <laughs> so, well, uh, you, so, so you actually became a diplomat uh, in a very interesting period of history with uh, the European Certainly. Union going from, from um, well, uh, an idea. Economic community, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. to, to, I think it's 28 nations now, is that correct? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. But Taiwan's history, evolution, parallels, in some respects, European Union. Uh, I first went to Taiwan in uh, I think 1998 or 1999, somewhere in there, President Lee was the um, oh. uh, first mm -hmm. president that I met. Um, very uh, erudite, articulate individual. Mm -hmm. And he was keenly uh, interested in whether I was related to um, 
uh, George Leslie Mackay, oh, yes. uh, the, uh, the uh, Presbyterian missionary. And mm -hmm. um, he, uh, yeah. uh, he was a bit disappointed, shall we say, when I really, I couldn't make the connection. <laughs> I thought I thought about trying to make a connection, but I didn't think that was a good idea to to uh, make up uh, fairy tales uh, in the presence of a president of a of a nation like uh, like um, Taiwan. Um, so I I'll be interested in your thoughts as to mm -hmm. the role of missionary McKay um, in the formation of modern Taiwan. George Leslie Mackay um, is a uh, very famous in Taiwan. Everyone know if you even a little child, you know why? Because um, during his tenure in Taiwan, he did a lot of a lot of things for Taiwanese people, including um, establish the first uh, Western clinic in Taiwan and the first uh, girls' school in Taiwan, um, and. Uh, a lot of uh, churches uh, he built and contributed to. So till today, uh, Taiwan people still remember him, especially there is a uh, um, Makai Memorial Hospital uh, because uh, in memory of um, George Leslie Makai's contribution. So that's why Taiwanese know him very well, but really uh, no one in Canada so that's why in Queen's Park every year, the Parliament Chamber, uh, they will, they're one of uh, um, MPP, uh, I believe uh, MPU met him, uh, Ernie Harmon. Yeah. He met, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so he is uh, from Oxford County. That is uh, Mackay's uh, hometown in Canada. So that's why this connection make uh, uh, MPP Ernie Harman uh, make an announcement in commemoration of Mackay's. And at the same time, uh, they want to connect uh, Taiwan and uh, Canada through Mackay's historical tie and to facilitate bilateral friendship. It's, it's an interesting relationship not only on a micro level between Mackay or McKay, I'm never quite sure whether he's Mackay or McKay. Um, and Mackay, uh, yeah, or I Mackay. think it is Mackay, yes. Um, and he spells it M A C as opposed yeah. to yeah. M C. But it's an interesting relationship, <laughs> uh, as far as uh, a missionary with Christian values, uh, coming to a country and bringing. Um, if you will, a Western way of doing things, but uh, but also rooted in Christian principles. Um, the role of Christian missionaries in Asia um, is a uh, would be an interesting study because they were also in China quite quite extensively as well, um, and um, and have influenced the Canadian uh, civil service and uh, influenced the Canadian civil service attitude towards China. But that's another. That's another story altogether where uh, we're going to talk about Taiwan. So Taiwan, when I went there first, was um, an island that I didn't know much about. I dare say that most Canadians know very little about Taiwan, particularly 20, 25 years ago. So tell me about your island and how you have transformed from a, um, a dictatorship to a vibrant democracy? Well, it's a long journey. Um, when I was little, uh, it still uh, has a, a martial law applied um, in our society. And when I grow up till the uh, senior high school, uh, we lived that martial law and uh, uh, open more, um, I would say, freedom of speech, freedom of the media now is happening at that time. Since then, uh, it's a turn to Taiwan society into a very vibrant one. Um, so then we have a direct election. Uh, 
the first uh, direct e uh, presidential election in 1996. Um, then uh, 2000, year 2000, there's uh, in the history, first time we have uh, a different ruling party yeah, in the government. Those kind of uh, democratic mechanism is uh, uh, go growing and becoming mature until this year, January president election, we just completed. Uh, we have a very proud of uh, Taiwan's democracy and uh, the world also see Taiwan as a beacon of democracy in Asia. Um, but uh, I would say this is a, a concerted efforts by our people and our governments over the past decades. I, uh, I think you've gone through the history of democracy in Taiwan uh, quite quickly because there is a number of dramatic incidents. Like President Lee was initially um, KMT, uh, Kuomintang, um, and he was an appointed leader, and then he became an elected leader, which was pretty impressive. And then after he became an elected leader, uh, there's a, a change in party from Kuomintang to um, DPP. And uh, I think that is remarkable. That is absolutely remarkable in the history of, of uh, transfers. So, you know, you, you, you realize that the hallmark of, of governments um, in, uh, in uh, democracies is the peaceful transition of power from one election to the next. And Taiwan has demonstrated that. Um, and then after that, uh, KMT got elected under um, President Ma, and uh, then uh, and then uh, back again to DPP. I think this is the third election in a row that DPP is has won. Is that correct? Yes, yes, you are correct. Yeah, is uh, also making the history record. Yeah, yeah, three terms in a row for one party to win the presidential election. And Taiwan uh, gave a message to the world um, in January, was it January or February? January. Uh, January, mm -hmm. that um, uh, democracy is extremely important. The mm. transition governments can happen. The elections can be free, free and fair. And that it was, if you will, the first um, democratic, uh, first election of a democracy in 2024. Um, all of which is interesting from the standpoint of those of us who are political hist historical nerds, that um, Taiwan has gone from a dictatorship to leading a, a leading democracy in the space of 25 years. Pretty impressive. Yeah, thank you, um, John. Thank you for um, making those comments on Taiwan democracy. I just, as I say, I truly uh, proud of uh, um, Taiwan. Uh, we have a mad achievement in dem dem democratic development, but at the same time, um, you know that uh, Taiwan's uh, international situation is very unique. <laughs> yes. It's very unique. Yes, yes. So no. we are talking about um, so being a diplomat, being a Taiwanese diplomat. I have been posted in several countries, including United States, Malaysia, Vietnam, and now in Canada. So all the time we have a facing a uh, challenge especially in the international participation mm -hmm. so when we manage the, our domestic uh, politics uh, uh, our people's economy our daily life so and we become the uh, strength in advanced technology and innovation we are the leading producer of uh, semiconductors in the world we play very key role in the global supply chain and that's why because of a COVID-19 because of the Ukraine war then more and more people across the world more and more country across the world are aware of Taiwan and can tell the difference 
between Taiwan and China, uh, and then appreciate uh, Taiwan's contribution to the world in terms of a democracy example and uh, also a uh, health uh, care system. And uh, uh, during COVID-19, we have uh, supported uh, facial mask when the world uh, encountered the shortage of that. And then during, and also the shortage of uh, chips during the COVID-19, Taiwan still making uh, uh, production and to support the global supply. Uh, and that's very important for every people and every country. So what I'm gonna say is that um, when we say, uh, um, how to say, congratulations for Taiwan's democracy achievement. And uh, we also need the, the, the world uh, to invite, to include Taiwan into the international um, organizations such as uh, UN WHO system. WHO and, and WHO. Uh, WHO, WHA, yep. Yes, WHA, yes, right. That's what I'm gonna say. So the basically I want to back to into the 1971. And so I, we know that year, UN Assembly, General Assembly passed a resolution 275A and Taiwan's uh, UN seat replaced by PRC, uh, People Republic of China. And since then, we have been, Taiwan have been excluded from the UN system, including excluding from WHA, ICAO, we just mentioned that. So now we work very hard. We are, we are struggling to find a table in the international stage. So that's our challenge. So when we talking it, about it is uh, actually it is actually quite a remarkable story how China has attempted to marginalize Taiwan internationally and diplomatically, and has let's between let's be fair has had some success, and uh, the uh, Taiwanese diplomats and the Taiwanese government have had to do workarounds. And frankly, you've been brilliant at it. Um, yeah, the usual diplomatic channels that are available to diplomats from recognized countries uh, are not available to Taiwan. And, um, and uh, you and your colleagues in Ottawa and elsewhere um, use parliamentary diplomacy brilliantly. If you can't talk to the diplomats, your counterparts in Global Affairs Canada, for instance, um, you talk to the to the um, politicians, the uh, the members of parliament, and I dare say that that's been your uh, and I don't I can't speak for other countries, but that has been a brilliant alternative that you have used to keep Taiwan front and center on the uh, consciousness of Canada and other nations. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, the, uh, in admiration <laughs> of how you have done that, that workaround. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested in your comments on how Canada has had a, how should we say, less than forthright relationship with Taiwan we trade with you, we have people exchanges, but simultaneously we don't allow the, the president of your country to make a visit to this country. So in light of our am ambiguity and our, um, we, uh, our uh, strategic ambiguity, I guess is the way to put it, um, what is your... Uh, message to the people of Canada uh, as far as trying to normalize or move towards normalization of nation to nation status. Well, thank you, John. Uh, first, I want to um, mention that Canada-Taiwan relations have been growing closer, uh, closely uh, in the recent years. I would say in 2022, 
Canada released its first Indo-Pacific strategy. And in that document, mentioned Taiwan for seven times and including Taiwan as an important partner in the region for Canada. I think it's a very important uh, uh, message. And then the year later, last year, 2023, we say there's a landmark year for Canada-Taiwan relations. Both side, both countries uh, have signed a series of agreements on healthcare, indigenous affairs and uh, investment, and recently uh, have a, a arrangement, collaboration on technology and the science. And then you just mentioned the delegation of uh, Canadian parliamentarians uh, made a visit uh, to Taiwan several times uh, after COVID-19 pandemic, when we opened the borders. So this, this is very important to send a clear message to the world that Canada's support of a democracy, support of a Taiwan, and the visit made by yourself and other parliamentarians is very important to facilitate mutual understanding between Taiwan and Canada. So those kind of uh, um, things has made uh, bilateral relations uh, uh, more closely and friendly and definitely is a win-win for both countries and both peoples. And we are delighted to see that development and we still working very hard on that to strengthen and the expanding our collaboration on economic and trade and also um, investment technology, those kind of uh, areas. And I want to share a little bit of what, what I, my observation. When I arrived in Canada, Toronto, in 2021 amid COVID-19, I find the uh, uh, media and the think tank academia have a, a lot of uh, discussion and coverage on Taiwan. They're talking about uh, Taiwan's healthcare system. They're talking about uh, Taiwan's democracy and our uh, chip and producers capability. And even recently, there's about uh, Taiwan's earthquake. After earthquake, the sweet response to earthquake, mm -hmm. those kind of uh, right. issues. So Taiwanese diaspora has mentioned to me that this, uh, he felt very proud of Taiwan for the first time in recent years. Suddenly, Taiwan became the aware and famous among Canadians. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody know Taiwan. And uh, one of them went to the shops and mentioned about he is from Taiwan. And the owner, he is a Ukrainian with a Ukrainian background saying, oh, we appreciate Taiwan. You give a, a support a lot after inv Russia invasion of Ukraine. Um, Taiwan is a good force uh, for good as we continuing um, support financially and uh, donation fund and in kind of medical equipment and medication to Ukrainian people. And now we are working with the Ukrainian government and uh, Eastern European country to help them to do post-war uh, reconstruction project. So those kinds of things, um, yeah, just want to share those, with- Those, uh, uh, those are, uh, critically important initiatives, and um, and do show that uh, the, um, if you will, the good heart of the people of Taiwan towards uh, international stability and um, and uh, proper rule of law and uh, trade relations. So I, I I think every one of those things you mentioned is uh, an initiative that I think uh, how should we say um, observant people, thinking people have taken note of. Um, over the over the uh, the years, and have um, made the image of Taiwan far more um, in focus, for want of a better term, uh, before the, it was kind of out of focus. But the other thing I think that's putting Taiwan in focus these days is its critical position um, in the South China Sea, because uh, it's become pretty obvious that uh, China. Uh, wants to invade and take over Taiwan. 
by whatever means uh, it, it thinks it needs to, uh, for whatever reason it thinks it needs to. Um, and the, the geopolitical significance of that is that China becomes a unilateral regional hegemon um, over the Philippines, over Japan, over South Korea, um, pushes the American um, Seventh Fleet out into the middle of the Pacific um, and makes uh, all trade through that area, which is about 40% of the world's trade through that area, uh, quite problematic. Um, and there isn't any country in that region that doesn't look at the aggressive um, stand of China with a, a bit, not only a bit of skepticism, but a, but a bit of fear. So Taiwan has become extremely important to the, uh, if you will, even a linchpin to, um, to Western values, which I, I think is an interesting development over the last 20, 25 years. Hmm. Yes, right. Right. Um, yes, right. I think the political uh, position Taiwan now in the, I, that's why we have uh, received the stronger support from the country, like-minded countries across the world. Um, so we appreciate that uh, the statement have been made by politicians from different countries, including Canada, United States, in the bilateral or multilateral forum, they all stress the importance of <clears throat> maintaining status quo across the Taiwan Strait. And certainly is very important for Taiwan. At this, uh, at this moment, uh, we are looking to boosting our self-defense capability and our economic resilience we also look for more and a close collaboration with like-minded country to ensure the status quo across the street. And all countries in the entire world need to send a clear message that we don't want war, we don't want any conflict in the region. As John Yu just mentioned in the region, a lot of uh, disputes uh, existing between countries with uh, China. So when people mention Taiwan issues, uh, then nowadays people probably mention more often say China issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, instead of a uh, Taiwan issue, because China right. now has a lot of uh, dispute with uh, its neighbors. Yeah, that's it. Well, they they, they uh, have seen what happened to Hong Kong, and um, and the Taiwanese people have seen what happened to Tong Hong Kong, and it, it's interesting that uh, their response in the election was to uh, uh, to uh, vigorously support DPP as the, if you will, the most independent party in in Taiwan. So uh, uh, things are changing. Um, and Director General uh, Jin Ling Chen, um, we are coming close to the end of our time. Um, I uh, buy completely um, mm -hmm. the notion that Taiwan is critical to the uh, geopolitical, um, how should we say, peace and stability of the area. Um, and one of the things that is on offer is the CPTPPP, um, and Taiwan is up for uh, consideration um, <clears throat> as to a member of that. Um, let me leave you with this question. Why is it in Canada's best interest that Taiwan becomes a uh, member of the uh, the Pacific Trade Organization. Yeah, thank you for, yeah, this CPTPP, we have a submitted application in 2021 and still waiting for the further action taken by members of the CPTPP. Taiwan need to be a part of it. 
And uh, we say it's not uh, good for Taiwan, but also for Canada and other member states of the CPTPP. As you know, this is a very modern free trade agreement. And the expansion of membership of the CPTPP is good for all parties, uh, especially the per economic trade protectionism increasing and uh, getting uh, how to say that? I'll, I'll put it in other way that uh, because Taiwan is, uh, though it's a small island with 23 million population, but its economy is larger than most of the countries. For instance, 20, we larger than 22 of 27 countries in the EU. Hmm. So if we be, become part of a CPTPP, we def definitely will make the contribution and uh, we are leading producer of uh, semiconductor and all advanced ICT components in the world. There's uh, uh, Taiwan strength and we can contribute. And for the Canada, um, we know that uh, the broader area, there will be uh, benefit to everyone. Because uh, in the CPTPP, we know it's a touch of the main area like electronic commerce, in intellectual property, and the state owned enterprises. So, those kind of things uh, in the, uh, the current uh, trade agreement. Uh, short of that. So we see this is a, a very good opportunity for Canada. And this year, Canada taking the chairship, chairmanship in the CPTPP Commission. And we do hope that uh, Canada can champion discussion on the rule setting up of a new applicant. And Taiwan is one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have been the closer trading partner of Canada. So we, we do hope that we can see the very more uh, specific uh, development uh, progress this year. Well, um, I think that's where we're going to have to leave it. And I want to thank you for this remarkable conversation in both your and my, your, your diplomatic life and my political life. Uh, we have seen a remarkable transition from a, democ uh, from a dictatorship to a democracy, from a um, relatively backward economy to one of the world's leading economies, um, and to a, uh, a sophisticated example of, of an um, Asian nation uh, joining the 21st uh, century in a, in a way that is admirable to all. Um, and um, so I just wanted to thank you for that. I'm hoping that this year uh, will be the, the next step, if you will, in the evolution of um, uh, Taiwan and Canada's relationship. Um, and we already do a, a fair bit of business together, but there's always, there's always an end up doing backdoor stuff, which we should be doing front door stuff. So, so uh, Jen Ling Chen, I wanted to thank you for uh, making yourself available um, this has been a good conversation. I uh, hope that the people of Scarborough, Guildwood and beyond uh, appreciate the um, significance uh, of uh, Taiwan, um, not only uh, in the regional area, but also to Canada as well. So again, thank you and uh, appreciate, appreciate you being with me. Thank you for having me. Thank you, MP. Thanks for listening to What We Give. I'm John McKay. If you want to stay up to date with the writing of Scarborough Gilwood, sign up for the newsletter on johnmckay.libparl.ca. Thank you for listening.